What exactly is a theory? Well, with regard to any of the sciences, a theory is a prediction. It's a, a broad sort of explanation for why something is occurring. So, but what it really does for us with regard to research is it sets the foundation for how we're going to describe the research project to you, the reader, the individual, to society. Theories have to be broad enough to give us that foundation, but they also have to be narrow enough to help us to predict and explain why that phenomena is occurring. In sociology in general, we have three slash four major theories that we use. Now, you'll see why I say three slash four as we move along here. Any one of our good sociological theories that has withstood the test of time has to answer two key questions. And those two key questions are, how do we exist? How does society exist? What is it that keeps us together, makes us want to stay together? And how do we change? What are the elements that contribute to how society changes? Every good sociological theory must address those two key questions. If it doesn't, it's not going to withstand the test of time. So our major theoretical perspectives, the ones that we use pretty much every single day in our work to observe society, have been around for a little bit of time. We're going to talk about each one of those three slash four theoretical perspectives individually here. And we're going to link them to the micro and the macro perspective. All right, so the first theory that we want to talk about is functional theory. You'll also hear this called functionalism or even structural functionalism, although that structural piece of the title didn't come about until eh, about the 1950s, 1960s. It's still talking about the same basic theory. Functionalism has been around since the beginning of sociology. It's the oldest theory. Functionalism is a macro perspective in that it looks at how the structure impacts the individual. And functional theory asks the basic question, what holds us together? What is it about the structure of society that functions for most people? So this theory rests on the premises of balance, so to speak, and it answers those two key questions exactly that way. All right, and so in response then to those two key questions, functional theory says that society has to exist in a state of balance, kind of like an organism, and this goes all the way back to the work of some of our earliest social theorists. This theory would say that society is working for most people, and it ain't broke, so don't fix it. It says that uh, the structure of society works in a very balanced, methodical kind of way, sort of like how an organism has all of these different parts. If we look at just a cell, the cell has certain components. It has the cell wall and the mitochondria and the nucleus and all of these other components. Each one of those components has a job, and each one of those components has to function properly for the cell to exist. So, like an organism, this theory describes society exactly the same way. It says that we have different parts of society, each of those parts has a role, and each of those roles must function to its best optimal ability in order for society to be functioning well. So, that's the answer to the first question. How do we exist under functional theory in a balanced, methodical state? a stable type of society. In answer to the second question, how do we change? Well, this theory goes all the way back to the work of uh, Herbert Spencer, Auguste Comte, Emile Durkheim, and Charles Darwin, who wasn't a sociologist, but that's when this theory was applied to sociology back in his time. And so you can see the link to uh, Darwin's evolutionary theory. This theory says that society changes by a process of evolution. 
that this is a slow process, that it happens on its own, that we don't have to intervene to make this happen. This idea was very heavily influenced by Charles Darwin. You know, Darwin did his work about the species evolving over time, and he made observations that, for example, when a bird no longer needs that long beak, over time, over generations, the beak will start to get smaller. Uh, when that animal no longer needs a tail for balance, for example, uh, over time, over generations, that tail will disappear. And so the exact same concept that Darwin used is applied with the study of society in functional theory. Functional theory says that we will change over time. As a response to things that are dysfunctioning in society, this doesn't require us, however, to do anything. It doesn't require any effort on our part at all. It's going to happen on its own. And that leads us to the major criticism of this theory. It doesn't require us to do anything. It requires no effort on our part. And we know that the status quo is supported in society. And so the major criticism here is that uh, this type of theory leave it alone, don't worry about it, it's working for most people, marginalizes the experiences of minorities, women, African Americans, Hispanics, elderly people, uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered people, all get marginalized under this type of view of society that eventually things will just work themselves out. So as a response to functional theory, which was around since the beginning of sociology, conflict theory comes onto the picture, and it takes an opposing view. While it's still a macro perspective, it talks about things not being fair, not being equal, and the struggle that most people have to exist in this type of unequal society. Uh, some of our key players with regard to conflict theory, primarily back in the day, Karl Marx was our first conflict theorist. Uh, along with him, we have some contemporary theorists who also uh, view society through this lens of social inequality. Uh, we could assert that many of our feminist theorists are also conflict theorists. All right, so conflict theory. Karl Marx was the first one, and he said, you know what, I'm not buying this idea that society functions for most people and that it's just going to work itself out, it will fix itself. He says, I don't see society that way. He says, I see society as in a constant state of competition. And he said that that competition is over scarce resources, whatever those resources are. It could be jobs, it could be money, it could be shelter, it could be food, uh, it could be clothing. doesn't matter what the resource is. He says that we're constantly struggling to get our fair share of those uh, scarce resources. And he says that uh, contrary to the belief that evolution is going to take care of everything and it will all just work itself out, he says that revolution is the way to change society. And he says that we must then intervene to make society change in a way that is best for most people. And realistically, uh, just like evolution is the main criticism of functional theory, revolution is the main criticism of conflict theory. And a lot of people would say, you know what, Marx, where's the revolution? If this system that we're living in is so bad, then why aren't we all up in arms revolting against it? We haven't seen that major, large-scale revolution that Marx would have said will occur when people get too uh, frustrated with the way the system is working. And we also have to say, you know what, the system does work for a large number of people. And so those people who are content with the system aren't going to bother to try and change it. So that's our second major theory, conflict. It's a macro level theory, just as functional theory is. Some of our primary conflict theorists, as I said, Karl Marx, Harriet Martineau was a conflict theorist. Jane Addams was also a conflict theorist. 
All right, and this third theory is called interaction perspective, and this is the newest, and this is the closest that we get to psychology. This is our biggest micro theory, and it asks the question, how do we interact with the social world? Still has to answer those two key questions about how we exist and how we change. This theory says that we exist based on the interactions that we have with other people. And those interactions are based on symbols. Those symbols can be verbal, such as me talking to you, or they can be non-verbal, such as you looking at the information on your screen right now. All of these things combined, whether we're talking about body language or we're talking about actual symbols for things, uh, help us to understand each other. And we can't have any kind of society if we don't understand each other. This theory says that at that more intimate level, those interactions that we have with each other every single day help us to negotiate with each other and that in turn helps to create a new society, a new reality that we have to live in. This theory works on the premise that what we do at this level, these interactions that we have with each other, help to shape the bigger picture. Where the other two, the macro perspectives, talk about those big forces that bear down on us and cause us to conform all of the rules and regulations that exist that make us uh, walk the straight and narrow. This theory says that we have some influence over that. These things that we do together can help to shape the bigger picture, can help to have an influence on the structure of society. And realistically, that's the major criticism of this theory. Just how much control or influence can I have on the structure of society? Can I, as an individual, change the bigger picture? And that's the question here. Some of our primary interaction theorists, and you've probably heard these names before in your psychology classes, uh, Mead, Bloomer, Irving Goffman, Howard Becker, all of these uh, are considered to be primary interaction theorists. So that's our third major theoretical perspective. Now, you'll recall at the beginning I talked about three slash four major theoretical perspectives, and here's where that slash four comes onto the picture. And this is feminist theory. Now, lots of people assume that when we're talking about feminist theory, we're only talking about women. That is not true. Feminist theory came about as a response to some of the problems that were inherent in these other types of theories. We had, for many years, only looked at things in society from the perspective of those who had power and control. And when we're talking about power and control, we're talking about white, rich men essentially, particularly when we're talking about contemporary American society or society in the West. So feminist theory arose when women started to gain some uh, sort of power in society, some sort of control over their lives, and these feminist researchers stepped out and said, hold on a second, we're looking at things from the perspective of men. We need to also factor in that the experiences of women are radically different than the experiences of men. At the beginning, while this theory addressed the concerns of women, as it started to grow and develop as a field of study, the use of feminist theory, uh, we started to see some similarities between the experiences of women who had been marginalized in society for hundreds of years and the experiences of minorities, African Americans, Hispanics, or Latino, Latina. Many other groups in American society have not had the same uh, good fortune and the same experiences as white men have. And so we started to be able to make some connections here with regard to feminist theory. Those connections primarily, how do the experiences in general of disenfranchised groups uh, play out in American society? Feminist theory is used at both the macro 
and the micro level, but it has its roots in conflict and interaction theory. So in that respect, it cannot stand alone. It builds its ideas on the backs of conflict and interaction theories. So if we use feminist theory from a conflict perspective, it addresses those same two questions. How do we exist in a state of competition? How do we change through revolution? If we use feminist theory at a more micro level, we take the same questions that an interaction theorist would ask. How do we exist? Uh, we share meanings through interactions. How do we change? We negotiate a new reality. So feminist theory can't really exist just on its own. It gets its foundation from those two other theories. And now so you can see why I call it kind of a slash four theory. It doesn't stand by itself, but still an essential uh, research theoretical orientation for today's sociologists. And, you know, it has the same criticisms. Where's the revolution? It never happened. Although we can say that there have been some small pockets of resistance over time, we haven't really seen the complete system being overthrown. Uh, it also contains that same interaction criticism. How much can I, as an individual, or these small groups that I'm involved in, how much of an influence can we really truly have on the structure of society? So many of our conflict theorists and many of our interaction theorists would also uh, consider themselves to be feminist theorists.